Welcome to TEC2. My name is Bill Bailey. I'm the Hydronics Manager here since about 2004. Today what we want to talk about and explain to you is basically the modern components of a hydronic heating system. Basically the first thing is the boiler. There's all different types of boilers, different styles, different efficiencies, everything else. We'll touch on these more in depth in future videos. But basically the first component is the boiler system. The second component is an expansion system. We're going to break this down and talk a little bit more about that later, but basically number two is the expansion system. Our third section is basically the circulation. We've got to get that hot water from the boiler to number four, which is our terminal units. The terminal units can be anything from baseboard to cast iron radiators to a radiant floor heating system. Give me fan call units. But those are the four major components in a modern hydronic heating system. Two that we're going to talk about most today are basically the expansion system and the circulation. So how are we getting from boiler to terminal unit is the basic topic of discussion today. The expansion system. What is the function of the expansion system? The expansion system is here because this is a closed loop hydronic system. That means we fill it up with water once, we get rid of the air in the system, and then basically just keep reheating this water and circulating throughout the system, from the boiler, through all these interior components, out to the terminus and back around. Water expands when we heat it. The expansion system is here to do a few things for us. One, through the expansion tank, it handles that expansion. That expansion, as that water heats, it has to have somewhere to go. If we didn't have the expansion tank, that water would come out the relief valve. Water expands, needs somewhere to go. We don't give it somewhere to go, it comes out the relief valve. That's not a good thing, because then we are bringing in fresh, hot, fresh water back into the system. Fresh water means minerals and air. We don't want minerals and air back in our water. So we put an expansion tank. As the water heats up, pushes down onto the air section of the diaphragm tank, as you can hear here, very light noise, and on the top we've got water. So it expands, pushes down, we can compress air, as it cools back down, it rises back up, that diaphragm rises to its natural position, and just sits there. So nothing comes out our relief valve. That's what the expansion tank does. You always want to have the expansion tank with basically the connection nipple up. That means that no air can get into the top of this tank. If we turn it on its side, we could have air possibly getting in there, reducing the amount of expansion that that tank can deal with. So always want to make sure you got the nipple up. From the expansion tank, we go up to the air eliminator. In hydronics, we're pretty simple. What's an air eliminator do? It eliminates air. What is in this device is basically a stainless steel brush or maybe a copper brush that basically attracts air. Think of the spaghetti pot at home. As you're heating that water, what happens? You see air on the sides of that pot first. That air was in the water from the get-go. Didn't come in from outside, it was in that water. And as we heat water, we eliminate that air. We try to get rid of it. That's what happens to your spaghetti pot. In here, we're trying to do the same thing. We want that air out of our system. So the little brushes in that air eliminator attract those bubbles, just like the size of your spaghetti pot, and basically they get big enough, they join together, they float up to the top of the vent, and the vent releases them out of our system. That's what an air eliminator does. Years ago, we used to have a thing called an air scoop, which is basically a piece of cast iron with a little bulge in it. It did the same thing, but it had nowhere near the surface area to collect those air bubbles, those little bubbles of air, those micro bubbles that they used to call them, and gather them. So an air scoop was generation one, an air eliminator, generation two and beyond. The last part of the expansion system is basically our reducing valve backflow preventer section. Why do we need a reducing valve? Well, think about it. Most municipalities give us 50 to 60 psi of pressure coming into our house. That's great for taking a shower and everything else. But our boiler only has a 30 pound relief valve on it. So if I bring 60 pounds into my boiler system, and I have a 30 pound relief valve, where do you think it's gonna go? Yep, 
right out the relief valve. Then what happens? Then we bring more water in. We bring more minerals in. We get this little vicious cycle going on. So we don't want that. Okay? A pressure reducing valve does exactly what we're saying. It reduces that 60 pounds of pressure down to about 12 pounds, which is a typical hydronic system, thereby eliminating that relief valve from popping off and releasing water. The last component in here is basically most municipalities require it's a backflow preventer. Nowadays, it's a backflow preventer with vent to atmosphere. And what we basically have is the backflow with a check valve here, a check valve here, and a vent to atmosphere. So for some reason, the municipality lost pressure, and our system's sitting here at 12 pounds, and they're at zero. What will happen is water's going to try to travel back. In this application, we have one check valve, we have a vent, we have another check valve. So even if it gets past that first check valve here, it's going to vent to the atmosphere. It will never get back in the municipal city supply. These are the components of a typical expansion system in a new hydronic application. Sometimes on a hydronic system, we don't want 100% water coming into the system being circulated. Sometimes we need glycol or commonly called antifreeze. This could be a snow melt system, this could be a system with maybe a chiller hooked up to it, but we don't want 100% water, so we want a mixture. This reservoir here, this tank, is pre-filled with the correct mixture to deal with the freeze protection that we're looking for. It has its own little pump inside and its own pressure valve. So as our system is looking for that 12 pounds of pressure, this thing will kick on and off. It hooks in the same way as our backflow preventer and reducing valve. But since we don't have a connection to the city, the backflow preventer is no longer needed. And since this only gives us 12 pounds of pressure, we don't need a reducing valve. So basically this unit is self-contained. If we lose any fluid, we want to find out. If I lose seven gallons of fluid, I want to find out where that went. Then we refill it, fix the leak or whatever, refill the system with the correct mixture and we're all good to go. As you can see here, it pipes right in, comes in to the expansion tank port, and goes right up to the air eliminator. So if there's any air in this solution, which there will be, it goes right up. First thing it sees is the air eliminator out of this system, circulates around, goes on from there. The circulation section, what does this do? Well, basically, we have this heated water in the boiler that basically goes to the expansion system or through the expansion system due to the circulation. All right, what the circulator does is transfer that water around the loop. In here, you see a bunch of different circulators. These are small little, what are called wet rotor circulators, variable speed or multiple speeds, one, two, or three. And in the end here, we've got a variable speed circulator. Interesting to note right now, it's going to take a couple minutes to happen. We're running about 38 watts of power, moving about nine gallons a minute. Ryan's going to shut off a couple zones, simulating a zone valve actually shutting off. And in a few minutes, we'll look and see what that's doing. The biggest thing you got to remember about a circulator is basically it's creating a pressure differential. And by doing that, it causes water to flow. We're not really pumping the water up in the system. It's already there due to our fill valve system, part of the expansion. All right. But what you got to remember, this thing's creating a pressure differential net forces the water through the system. A couple things to note about these wet rotor circulators though is orientation of what we call the motor shaft. These circulators have to always have this motor shaft that's in here in a horizontal position. If you return it like this or upside down like this, that shaft is now in a vertical position and it will deteriorate and basically void the warranty on the circulator. So the thing you want to remember is always keep that shaft in that horizontal position. As you see here, all these shafts are in a horizontal position. All right. Another thing you got to remember is don't ever put the motor like this. All right. This is all the guts, the electronics down here. So if this ever sweats or anything else, that water goes directly here. So basically, Keep the circulator like this. Any one of the vertical positions, our shaft is horizontal. Right? Turn it like this, our shaft is still horizontal. 
all the way around. If you want, motor on the side is fine. Motor on the top is fine. Motor on the other side is fine. Not that. So no motor on the bottom. No vertical shaft. We go back here, looking at our variable speed circulator. What we see now, we're down to 19 watts. Ryan shut off a couple zones, simulating like maybe a bedroom or two shut down. This circulator noted that through the electronics in it and basically slowed itself down. So now we're only moving three gallons a minute and we're consuming about 19 watts of power. Most of our kids leave on more than that every day in the house. So this is the future of the circulator world, these variable speed circulators. The last thing you see here, and you won't see it on a lot of systems, but as we get to be able to zone more and more, we can have a basement, we can have a garage, we can have small zones, all right? When you go get smaller and smaller zones, what you're creating is those zone valves opening and closing more and more. That could possibly short cycle the boiler. We said we'll talk about boilers later, but boilers want to run continually. What this does, and it's called a buffer tank, and in this application is a boiler buddy. What it does is basically stores BTUs. The boiler runs, fills this tank up with nice warm water, whatever temperature it should be, and then shuts down. So the boiler runs for a nice long span, stores BTUs in this tank, and then as all these little zones pull BTUs out, we don't get the boiler to fire again. We don't need it to because we got all these BTUs we got to use up first. So that's what a buffer tank does. You'll see more and more of them as we get more and more zones within the hydronic system. Hopefully this helped. Hopefully you understand the components of a hydronic system. Like we said earlier, we will have future videos on different boilers and that kind of stuff. If you're ever looking for help, just give us a call. Thank you.